all that a pointer is is some location in memory where the data happens to be an address of somewhere else in memory. Look, I understand pointers are confusing. Well, at least they are to you, not to me. But it's time that your brain finally understood the magic of Every spot in your computer's memory has a numerical address. Program variables have an address. Some random ass file on your Linux PC has an address. Even your pins on an Arduino microcontroller or Raspberry Pi, even they have an address in memory. So you see these addresses, right? What if you wanted to, say, remember one of these or store one of these? I don't think I could remember one of these addresses for more than five seconds. So the goal here is to store an address because we want to, say, remember one. And as you can see, at every one of these addresses is some data, right? We've got this variable Jacob and there's the number two is stored at that address, right? Well, if you look closely, you can see these addresses, they're numbers. So what if we took an address and we just stored it as data at some other address. That's exactly what we do. We got a random address in memory, but at that address, we store a number. And that number just so happens to be the address of somewhere else in memory. And if we look closely here, I, I, I so kindly highlight it for you and show you, it's actually the address of another variable called Jacob. But it could have been, you know, it could have been any address. It could have been an address of nothing. It could have been an address of your mom's file that I happen to have, whatever. But just look here, right? So we can see in this C file, we have some variables, right? We've got the variable Jacob that we stored the value two into, just like we see in the memory. We've got gorilla who has the value seven. And we're making this new variable called a pointer. Now you could name it whatever you want, right? And as we can already see from this nice memory drawing, we want to store the address of Jacob inside of this new variable. And uh, if you just look here, well, that's exactly what we do. And this is how we do it. Again, we'll go into the syntax later, but this, it's this simple. This is a pointer. All that a pointer is, is some location in memory where the data happens to be an address of somewhere else in memory. I have a little example for your little 8-bit brain that will get you 85% of the way to full pointer enlightenment. So I know you love eggplants and their shape, so say that you have five eggplants and you have two friends. You want to divide your weird choice of snack among your friends. Oh, and trust me, pointers are genuinely going to help us accomplish this. I've got a little function made for us that just divides two numbers and returns the result. So we pass in five for our eggplants and we pass in two for our friends. What do you think this print statement is gonna say? Well, it prints two since two goes into five two times. Now sure, it does have a remainder of one, but we didn't calculate the remainder, did we? And computers only do what we ask them to do. Anyways, we are currently only returning the result or the quotient. And if we want to return the remainder as well, we probably want to go ahead and calculate it like this. <laughs> Wait, so now you have to return the remainder and the quotient. Can we do this? Is there a way in C to return two variables at the same time? So your, how do you say, dumbass self might be thinking, we just stick these two variables we want to return right here after this nice return statement. But no, buddy, that ain't gonna work. C in C, you can't technically return two variables at once. Okay, so the last wrong idea that people may have for solving this problem is to scrap the return statement entirely and just hand over our quotient variable and our remainder variable as arguments to divide num. Then inside of divide num, you might think we can just set the arguments equal to the quotient and remainder. Now you'd be correct, we sure can set them equal to that. But check this out, when we go back to main and print out their values, you're gonna see they still equal zero. Oh, okay, I think we've gotten through all of your guys' dumb ideas. This solution is wrong, but it's close to the right idea. It doesn't work because when we call divide num, 
We aren't handing over the actual memory associated with our variables. We're just handing over a copy of the data that's inside the variable. So inside of our function divide num, all we end up changing is this new copy. It's not actually changing the variables that are back in main. If that's still confusing, then after this video, you should go learn about function calling by value versus by reference. So it should be clear that what we really want is to somehow tell divide num where in memory these quotient and remainder variables live. If divide num could just know the address of these variables, then it could just go to that address and change the data that lives there. So uh, let's do that then. Now we pass their address to the function instead using this and percent symbol. And inside of divide num, we are no longer just receiving two normal integers. We are receiving addresses that point to an integer. And we indicate that with this asterisk symbol. See, and I can prove that to you real quick here if we just print out the data that lives inside these new pointers. They're long ass numbers that are actually addresses in memory. And by placing an asterisk in front of the pointer's name here, we can actually tell the compiler, hey, go to the address, set this location's data equal to the divide and this location's data equal to the remainder. And if we go back to main and print this out, we can see we finally have gotten our quotient and remainder values to change in main successfully. In that example, we showed how pointers are useful for giving a function access to some specific area of memory that we already care about. Passing variables by value, like these two arguments, leads to copies being made and more RAM being used. Which is not a concern in the case of these two small data types, unless we care to modify their values inside of the function, in which case we need a pointer. But to make this a bit more extreme, imagine we make an array of like 65,000 integers, which are 32 bits or 4 bytes, so we're talking 260,000 bytes. Then say we go to pass this massive array to our function. If this array was passed by value, that would mean we are copying the array to the function and reserving another 260,000 bytes of memory just to share this array with a function. So you can imagine how much of a waste of space this can become with even larger data types. And as we learned earlier, the solution is to simply tell the function the address that the array lives at by doxing them, I mean using a pointer. Now, it's worth noting that when it comes to passing some normal array as an argument, the compiler will do that for you. Now, to be honest, this is a bit confusing, so overclock that little brain of yours for just a minute here to stay with me. What I mean is that even if you go to pass an array in a way that looks like you're passing it by value, the compiler simply goes ahead and passes the address for you, as in it basically automatically passes a pointer to the array and will not do the whole make a big copy of the whole array and pass it by value thing. But weirdly, if you have an array that lives inside a struct and then you pass the struct by value to the function, you certainly will end up passing the entire array by value, thereby making that big ass copy that I referred to earlier. And yes, wasting all that space and memory. So this still is something you should keep in mind. I also didn't want to forget to note that there are effectively hardware pointers, not just software pointers like we saw earlier in the C program. For example, there is the instruction pointer, which is a hardware register within your processor that usually contains the address of the next processor instruction that needs executed. This register is also called the program counter. There is also the stack pointer, which stores the address of whatever is at the top, quote unquote, of your quote unquote stack. This topic should get its own video and maybe it will. Anyways, besides what I've already shown you, another use for pointers is dynamic memory allocation, which basically just means if at some point on the fly in your program, you decide you want to reserve some number of bytes in memory for something incredibly important, you will probably want to keep track of the address where that big block of reserved memory starts with a pointer. Pointers can also be used for more complex data structures, such as a linked list. But I had just one more amazing thought in my head. I wondered to myself, Obviously there are pointers and even double pointers, and I know there's even use cases for triple pointers, but where does it end? Can we make a quintuple pointer or even an octuple pointer? So I figure we'll shoot straight for the moon with creating an octuple pointer, AKA a pointer that is eight addresses deep, which is truly a feat of engineering.
and boom, we can see that indeed an octuple pointer works just fine. And of course it does, if you understand that each of these variables is just holding one memory address, and if you travel to that memory address, you'll find, wow, another memory address. And if you just keep following this chain, then eventually you find this famous integer that everyone says that they're pointing at. A pointer is just a variable that holds an address as its data. Pointers aren't confusing. At least they aren't to you, now that you've seen this video. This video made me wonder just how many pointers I could make on something like a little Arduino, as in something like a kilo pointer that has a thousand asterisks or more. Also, I want to do some other disgusting pointer tricks in a future video, so if you want to see me attempt that, consider subscribing. I'll see y'all pointer nerds later.